All right, we are going to jump right in and get started, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to Shed Talks this January. My name is Kate. I'm going to be your host today from right here at Shed Aquarium. Um, and today we are using Zoom's webinar feature. Uh, so what that means is I can't see you, I can't hear you, you can't see and hear each other. Uh, but there are ways that we get to interact with each other in this virtual space. So if you have any questions for the people that we're going to be meeting today, uh, please use the Q&A function. Uh, that's going to be in your taskbar. You're going to click Q&A. That's how you're going to ask questions just due to the volume of people here today. Also, um, if you have thoughts or if you have fun exclamations or you just want to say something to uh, myself and some of the others here, you can type that in the chat if you would like, uh, but we do prefer Q&A for questions. And we are going to try to answer as many questions as possible, but we do not guarantee getting to all of them. So just keep that in mind. All right, this morning we have an amazing opportunity to, to take a look at biodiversity here at Shed Aquarium by highlighting one of our amazing exhibits. So I would like to actually now introduce you to Erica Moss. She is a senior aquarist here at Shed Aquarium with our special exhibits team. Good morning, Erica. Good morning. How are you? I am well. How are you doing? I'm good. <laughs> Excellent. So let's jump right in and tell us about underwater beauty and all the work that's gone into it. Okay, well, hopefully everybody who is on this webinar has had a chance to see the underwater beauty exhibit. So you kind of have an idea of what this exhibit already looks like in your head. Um, but if not, we're going to go through a lot of pictures that we have taken um, throughout the exhibit, um, just to kind of give you an idea of what all the all the planning that went into this exhibit. Um, so the special exhibit space in Shed Aquarium is a small hall that is between the aquarium building and the oceanarium building and it rotates every few years um, for a new exhibit just to kind of keep things exciting at shed so the exhibit that was open right before underwater beauties was our amphibians exhibit if anybody had a chance to see that so this is kind of just an image of what the hall looked like with the amphibians exhibit up um, january 7th is when it closed and this is the time that we go into major construction, real fast turnover. Um, so within a few weeks, the space is completely bare. As you can see, the walls all torn down. There's just rails out. Um, that's the special exhibits team that was present for the teardown. Um, so us just kind of in that space, just getting ready to work. It kind of also gives you an idea of like how big the space is when it's empty um, and how much room we have to work with to be able to put exhibits up in there. Um, so from amphibians getting torn down, underwater beauty starts getting built. So you can see February 28th, a little over a month later, um, the walls of the exhibit or the framing of the exhibit has gone up. Um, and you can kind of start to see the exhibit take a little bit of shape. Um, again, it's going to be changing. The flow is going to be different just for every exhibit. Um, the picture on the right hand side is just us preparing for what exhibits we're going to be taking care of, discussing um, any of the logistics of opening an exhibit. We have about two or three weeks after the exhibit is finished and handed over to us to get all of the animals out before opening day. So it's always like a mad rush to, to get in there to get all of your animals and all that. So it's better to plan it beforehand so you know exactly what you're going to do and then execute it in those three weeks that we have in between um, us getting the exhibit and the grand opening of it. Um, you can do next slide. So for this exhibit, the conversation was, what is beauty? Um, everybody has a different idea of what beauty is. Um, most people are going to think of very colorful, very elegant looking animals, which usually translates to tropical saltwater animals, because that's where most of your color is going to be because of the coral reefs and all of that. So the picture on the left is one of the most colorful animals that we have in the exhibit. It's a square spot anthias male. So only the males get those, um, that square purple spot on his side. Um, so that's what we figured most people would think of as beauty. But the picture on the right um, is of a walking batfish, which some people may not find beautiful, but 
we thought he was beautiful. He looks kind of like a Dr. Seuss character. Um, he's got a little lore. So what looks like his nose is actually a little lore that comes down to be able to attract food to him. Um, so it just really spanned um, the different ideas as to what people consider beautiful or not beautiful. So we kind of tried to like incorporate everything that people would find beautiful. Um, so planning the exhibit, this, this exhibit didn't focus on a group of animals the way that previous exhibits had. We had lizards, we had amphibians, we've had crabs. So they're all kind of groups of animals. This one concentrated more on an idea or a theme. So we were able to kind of really play around with that. This is also one of the first exhibits that the aquarist actually got to put their ideas um, out there to have exhibits of their own in there. Usually it's a meeting that happens and it's like, these are the animals that we can get and this will divide up who's taking care of what. But this was more like, hey, I have this idea for a really cool exhibit and I would like to see that put into this. So not every idea made it. Um, we had some crazy ones that just logistically were not gonna work. Um, but a lot of the exhibits that are in there are ones that the Aquarius plant. Um, so that kind of gives you a sense of pride in your exhibit and you're just a little bit more connected to something when it was your idea and you got to see it all the way through. So this picture is of a coral exhibit. That's the very first um, exhibit when you walk in past the giant exhibit of when you walk into the hall. Um, and the idea for this exhibit was to have corals that you can show off their fluorescence. Um, so there are corals that bioluminesce. Um, it's fish can actually see it um, and we can't, our eyes just don't work that way. So what was the idea was have the same corals on each side of the exhibit and um, have a blue light on one side and a regular light on the other side. And that yellow panel that's in front of it, which you guys can still move in front of the exhibit, shows you what it looks like when the coral is fluorescing. So you can see what it looks like in regular light and see what it looks like underneath a, a blue light to fluoresce. So it was kind of a cool idea just to see like a a coral can be different colors depending on how somebody is looking at it. Um, the next idea that we had for an exhibit, this one was actually my idea. Um, there are a lot of colorful corals and a lot of the colorful corals don't actually use the sunlight to grow. Um, there's a lot of them that do. They have that algae that is in their tissues that they actually get food from. So they require sunlight for the algae to stay alive to then feed the coral. But there are a lot of colorful corals that lack that algae. Um, they are called non-photosynthetic corals. So even though they are this brightly colored, they can live in an exhibit that is completely dark. They do not require sunlight at all. And so I thought it would be really interesting to have all of those corals together um, just to see how beautiful and how uniquely shaped they are. And then just knowing that we could turn the light off and they would be absolutely fine. So there's sponges, corals, um, there's wire corals, which is that spiral. So it's all things that I was really excited about getting into. Um, so this was my idea and I'm glad that it got to be put in the exhibit too. Um, jellies, jellies are always a popular animal. Um, we had a couple of different ideas to display jellies in a way that people haven't. So one idea was to put three different species of jellies together in one exhibit. That's the picture that's on the left-hand side. Most jellies you have to keep separated by species just because they will eat each other. Um, that's just, that's how it works. You end up with one species, but every now and then you can end up putting species together because just the way that their body structures are, they can coexist. So that was the idea was to put three in one and it worked for a few years, but it just logistically over time, it just didn't work out. But that was the idea and we were actually able to do that. The picture on the right um, shows a type of jelly that's actually a hydroid as opposed to a jelly. Um, but these guys are really cool. They sit on the bottom. They don't pulse in the water like other jellies do. So trying to figure out a way to display them where people can see them, where they weren't just sitting on the bottom. So if you look closely, you can see in there a little like tree. Um, it kind of reminds me of those coin collectors that you used to see at Taco Bell back in the day where you try and catch the quarter on it. So that was kind of where the idea came from, but it gave them different platforms to sit on so that they would be throughout the exhibit as opposed to just sitting on the bottom. Uh, next slide. So another one of my exhibit ideas, uh, not only are animals beautiful, um, but the plants that grow near animals are also beautiful. So my idea was to have a exhibit that was just nothing but the macroalgae, which is what all of those 
colorful things, just all different shapes, sizes, color, growth patterns. Like I thought that would be a great idea. Um, we ended up putting seahorses in the exhibit um, just to have some sort of animal aspect to it, um, which I wasn't mad at because I'm the seahorse aquarist, so that made sense to me. Um, but I just thought that this was a really cool concept to also see that beauty lies in the environment that an animal lives in, not just the animal itself. Um, and the jellies in the background of that picture is the exhibit behind it. It's just a reflection. There's no jellies in that one. <laughs> um, just in case you're wondering when you're walking through there where the jellies are in here, it's, it, they're, they're not in there. <laughs> Um, so not only did we have saltwater ones, we also had freshwater exhibits too. Uh, there are some people that are saltwater people and there's some people that are freshwater people. And I live in saltwater. Um, saltwater is my favorite, but I understand that freshwater can also be beautiful too. So I have an appreciation for it. So we tried to also show an appreciation for larger freshwater exhibits as well. So the very end exhibit is a planted large mixed species uh, exhibit, which is very rare in the aquarium to have something that's that deep with live plants in it and all of the mixture of animals that are in it. Um, just from different freshwater habitats around the world, not necessarily all from one, but it's a kind of like a peaceful end to the exhibit where you just mix everything together. Um, and there are some colorful freshwater fish. So that's a picture of a discus. Um, that's not a natural coloration. Um, some animals are bred to be a little bit more vibrant. So that's not a natural color pattern, but still like we have some colorful animals in there too. So it still grabs people's attention, but then you can also appreciate the freshwater exhibit for what it is. Um, so throughout this exhibit, there's been a lot of things that we've learned, not only from exhibit design, uh, animal behavior, um, all of these are going to be kind of things we as aquarists learned um, about our exhibits. So one thing that you learn is when you steal a fish from a quarantine system that's meant to go to another exhibit and you take it for your own, um, you will regret it. So that cowfish in that picture, um, he likes to eat everybody's earrings when you dive in exhibit. He likes to bite fingers. He likes to nibble on ears. Um, he's made several of our aquarists bleed. So we've kind of learned that karma happens um, and you shouldn't steal fish that aren't meant for you. But I mean, he's, he's really beautiful. So he looks really good in that exhibit, but yeah, he, he definitely fights back. So that's <laughs> lesson one learned that we don't have to do that anymore. Um, also things that we've learned sometimes are not so funny. Sometimes it's uh, something that you would never think of. So when you are designing an exhibit, you think about just water quality and lighting and pump size and animals and how they're gonna relate to each other. So you, you think of all of those things when you set up an exhibit, but there are sometimes things that happen that you would never have thought about. Um, we had a clam exhibit where you could actually look down on the mantles of the clams so you could see all the colorful patterns. Everyone looks a little bit different. It's kind of like fingerprints and zebra stripes, like they're all just a little bit different. But we were having issues in our system where the clams just weren't doing well and we honestly could not figure out what was going on. And the thing that we learned is in the sand that was in the exhibit, it was a black sand just to make those colors pop even more. But the sand actually contained nickel, which nickel is toxic to invertebrates. And we didn't know that the sand had it. Uh, the sand shouldn't have. Um, it was just one of those things where it was so far out there as to what was going on. But it was something that we learned that was in the sand that we used in probably five or six of our exhibits. Um, so then after learning that, we had to take all of the sand out and replace it with different sands. So you can rack your head about what's going on with an animal and why something's not working and it could be the most obscure thing. So that was kind of lesson learned for us too, that sometimes it's, it's a really out there reason why something's not working. Um, also things that we learned was um, if you put animals together, sometimes they eat each other. Um, that's, that's nature. That's what happens. Um, we had frogfish, which is that picture on the left. Um, they are ambush predators. They also have the little lure on the top of their head to attract um, food to their mouths. And we started off with nine animals in the exhibit and we ended up with two. Um, but that's just, that's how that's how animals are, is they will 
sometimes just eat what's available. Um, so we did end up with two. Uh, we think they were a pair. They kind of like hung out together. We think they were a male and a female. So that's probably why they never tried to eat each other at that point. Um, and they would just kind of like, we called it cuddling, but fish don't cuddle. But that's kind of what it looked like they would do in the exhibit is just kind of like rock next to each other on a rock. So that ended up being really cute, but also learned that, you know, we could have ended up with one at that point too. Um, the picture on the right shows our silver sides, and sometimes they will eat their tank mates even if they are too big to be eaten. Uh, it doesn't mean that they won't try. So, you know, they will just sometimes, they're well-fed animals. Um, we give them a really balanced diet and feed them several times a day, but sometimes they just want to try something else too. So uh, sometimes they learn their lesson the hard way that you can't fit something in your mouth and Sometimes they're like, all right, I'm not going to eat for a couple of weeks because I just ate my take mate. So again, something that we learned from that. Um, when we get in animals, sometimes we get in animals that we didn't expect. So every now and then we'll get in hitchhikers is what we call them. So the picture on the left is, shows a little, little tiny sea urchin that actually came in with some of our algae, um, which is great because the urchins are cute, they're tiny, but also they're they're eating the thing that you're trying to display. So we got the algae in for display and, you know, the predator to the algae came in with it. Um, but it was kind of cool that we ended up with an urchin and we were able to put it in an exhibit somewhere else to be able to grow up. Um, that middle picture shows a nudibranch, which is a kind of slug. Basically, it's like a snail without the shell. Um, and these animals are so brightly colored and so beautiful. And the, one of our ideas for displaying um, an exhibit in this was to have different nudibranchs in an exhibit just because of their coloration. But they get that coloration from eating corals and sponges. Um, so that guy in particular, you can see how red he is. Um, he's red because he's eating the red sponge. So the animal that we're trying to display was actually being eaten by another animal. So sometimes hitchhikers are not a good idea. Um, and then we had to take, you know, that poor nudibranch off of the sponge. Um, and the sponge eventually didn't make it either because he had been eaten too much. So kind of one of those sad things. But then sometimes you end up with crabs on the right hand side um, that come in with your shrimp culture uh, that start off really small. And we just kind of keep them in the back because crabs are, you know, they have pinchers, they eat fish, they knock over things. So you kind of just hold them in the back for a little while. They become your friend. You start naming them. Um, but beneficial is we can grow them up and then they become food for a mantis shrimp or an octopus, um, which is also really cool that you get an animal in and you're able to grow it up kind of like a live food to then feed it out to your animals. So then it becomes something is like an enrichment item basically for your larger animals. Next slide. Um, sometimes it is easier to just get into an exhibit to clean it. Um, we have sponges on very long poles, we have rakes, we have all of the tools that you could possibly need to try and clean an exhibit from the top, but sometimes you just got to get in there too. Um, so every now and then we will take down an exhibit and rearrange it, we will clean it, um, stick your head into something. I mean, our job is is really messy. That's, you know, that's just what you sign up for when you do stuff like this. Um, but yeah, sometimes just easier and more fun to get into an exhibit to clean it. Uh, next slide. Okay, so Underwater Beauties opens and about the middle of the exhibit being open um, was when COVID happened. And I don't need to tell everybody how COVID was overwhelming. Every, we all lived it, we all understand it. Um, so it hit and we still had a job to do. And we had to figure out how to do the job while being safe. Um, suddenly we split our teams in half and half of our team wasn't there. So I only saw four people on my team of eight for two and a half months. And you need to figure out how to still care for your animals, still do everything that you need to do with half of your staff, but also making sure that you are safe too. So it was kind of, it was kind of a rough time for us. It was a rough time for everybody in general, and I'm not saying it wasn't, but just for us, it was that added pressure of trying to figure out how to still do our jobs while still being safe. 
Um, so we took a lot of pictures and videos and texted each other a lot and emailed each other a lot. Um, next slide. But we we all kind of were over it at some point. Like it was just, it took its toll on us. It took its toll on everybody. Um, and we just, sometimes it was, we needed a break. We needed something to kind of snap us out of it. Um, so what did we do? Uh, the next slide, we wrote each other haikus on our whiteboards. Um, we baked each other gifts, um, and treats and stuff and left them in the fridge. We did what we could to try and you know, support our team members while not being there. Um, and it kind of gave us something to look forward to every day that we we came in. I mean, we still had our animals and a job that we love doing, but it just kind of added a little extra something to like get us through those days. Um, so that was also, oh, you can go ahead and advance to the next one. So also when we were shut down, people weren't there. There was no guest in the building. Um, there wasn't a lot of staff in the building. So the animals went from being around a lot of people to being around practically nobody. So there are some behaviors that we started to notice with the animals when they were not exposed to people and sounds and commotion and all of that. So one of the things that we learned was in the um, very front exhibit, it used to be a school of pilchard when we first opened, um, which is a larger silverfish. It's very shimmery. Um, they did not do well in the exhibit for um, since the beginning. So we took them out and replaced them with what you see there, the silver sides. So silver sides also very flashy fish. Um, they school together. Um, we use them as feeders too, which was great for us to have um, feeder fish in the building as well as a display animal. But during the shutdown, they were a lot less stressed. They kind of spread out in the exhibit. They weren't in that bait ball um, kind of stress swimming pattern. And it was really interesting for us to see that because the second we opened up back to the public and these animals were exposed to people again, they started having that stress behavior and we started losing animals like 10 or 15 a day um, just because of the stress of having people there. So that was kind of an interesting thing that we didn't see coming, um, but it was a nice observation for us to be able to see like these animals just do not like this display with this many people. So we ended up pulling them off of display and, and making the, the display a little bit different. Um, it's now a freshwater exhibit that has some plants and the animals are a little less stressed, but that was something that we noticed. Um, and it gave us a chance to learn more about our animals when people weren't there. Uh, next slide. Also, um, during COVID, we had to figure out how to, um, you know, still enrich our animals, but also kind of have fun with us. Um, and Halloween is a is a time where we just really enjoy putting skeletons into exhibits. Um, so we just we kind of sunk the skeleton in a lot of exhibits um, to make it look like it's cleaning. And you know, these are the pictures that we take. But also having a skeleton in there provides habitat for animals to hide in. You can tuck like lettuce and things into the bones and it becomes a feeder. Um, so something different for the animals. So it is enriching for them, but it's also enriching for us too. Um, the picture in the middle is me putting a skeleton torso actually in our CEO's um, exhibit. So when she came in in the morning, she got to see a skeleton sunk in her exhibit. Um, but again, provides habitat for the fish. And then every now and then we have to dry out our skeleton and he ends up in a funny pose on top of some instant ocean boxes in our reserve room, which um, those boxes contain salt. We mix our own salt water for our live food sculptures and for smaller water changes. Um, we also mix salt water in the building on a much larger scale. We have one ton super sacks of salt that we use to mix in a giant basin for salt water around the building. Um, but we, as a special exhibits team, mix our own salt water basically for our live foods cultures, um, which is why we have the salt boxes of Instant Ocean there in case anybody didn't know what Instant Ocean was. Uh, next slide. So when an animal is comfortable in an exhibit, um, they don't stress out, they just kind of do natural behaviors. And the epitome of a natural behavior for an animal being comfortable is breeding. An animal will not use any more energy than what it has 
Um, if it's stressed, it's not going to spend the energy that it has on breeding. So when an animal does that, it shows like we have, we have achieved what this animal needs. They feel comfortable enough to then expend that energy to breed. So we had some breeding events with this exhibit being open. One of them was the mantis shrimp. Um, and you can see her holding on to all of those eggs that she has. Um, it, we don't keep the mantis shrimp together. Um, they're kind of like a married couple where like when they're together and they're good, they're great. But when they're together and they're not good, um, one of them kills the other one. So it's just, it's, we keep them separate. Um, so this girl ended up having eggs, just, she made them on her own. They weren't fertile. So we didn't have, you know, 600 baby mantis shrimp, but it was still kind of cool to see her actually one day just having all of those eggs, um, on her. So it was kind of cool that she was comfortable enough to do that. The picture on the right hand side shows a very tiny cardinal fish. Um, those are Bangai cardinal fish. And what's interesting about those animals is they are mouth brooders. So the male will actually hold the eggs in his mouth and he'll protect them for the seven days it takes them for them to hatch. He won't eat for those seven days. So he's actually starving himself while protecting his young. But once the young hatch, um, they have those stripes on them because they hide in the spines of urchins, which you can see this animal is doing exactly what it would be doing in the wild is it's hiding in the spines of this animal. So one day we came in and there was just little little cardinal fish in there just doing what they were supposed to be doing. Um, so that's also really rewarding to see that you took such good care of your animal and this is what happened. Um, also, we have bred a lot of cuttlefish. Cuttlefish are an animal that are really cool but have a really short lifespan. Um, most of these animals live about a year and that's it. So if you're going to display cuttlefish in your exhibit, you really do have to work on breeding them. So what they do is they lay eggs and then we are able to incubate those eggs. So you basically uh, toss them around in water just to keep them from uh, having fungus or bacteria growing on them. And depending on what species it is, a few weeks later, you end up hatching out baby cuttlefish, which is that picture on the left hand side. So you can see how small they are when they're born. Like that's a penny and that's a little tiny cuttlefish. Um, but the unique thing about cuttlefish is they can have more than one batch of eggs. So it's not like a giant Pacific octopus where they have one batch of eggs and then that's it for their entire life. Cuttlefish can reproduce constantly. So we are able to have eggs hatch out the eggs, the young grow up into adults who then lay eggs, and then we just kind of start the cycle all over again. Um, so that's something that we've been able to do throughout the exhibit. Um, so that's been a really interesting way for us to keep our collection going. And the cuttlefish are still on display right now. If you guys want to go see them, I think we're on probably the third generation of eggs um, at this point. So you guys check those out when you walk through the exhibit. Um, some fish don't lay egg clusters. Some fish don't have egg clusters that they keep in their mouth. Sometimes fish just spawn, um, which is just like a coral. When you see coral videos in the wild where like eggs and sperm just kind of go up in the water, that's what happens to fish too. So it's a little bit harder to breed animals that do that if, if you miss seeing them do it. So our larval team, which I'll talk about in a little bit, have found a way to collect eggs from larger exhibits from animals that are spawners. And so we were able to collect eggs and grow up green chromis, which are those blue fish on the right hand side. So you can see the adults on the left and then the young on the right. So we were able to grow them up and then have them display the babies actually across from the exhibit where the parents are. So that was something that we were also able to do in the time span of this exhibit as well. Um, and this one is my personal favorite. Um, I am, like I said, I'm the seahorse aquarist. I take care of the seahorses and the sea dragons. And the epitome goal of my aquarist existence was to breed sea dragons because not a lot of people have done it. It's a very unique thing. It's a very hard thing to happen. Um, and we actually had it happen in 2018. And it was amazing. It was like, I... I was not even at work the day that it happened and I came into work to sit there in front of this exhibit and just stare and just be so excited for this happening. Um, so sea dragons are a little bit different than seahorses. Seahorses have a pouch that they keep their young in. Sea dragons carry the eggs on the outside of their tail and the males get pregnant. So this is a picture of a male with the eggs on the outside of his tail. 
So when the female lays the eggs, they're really sticky. And um, it's kind of like, it's, it's a really sticky mucus that um, will stick to the underside of his tail. And then as uh, he incubates those eggs, the skin on his tail will actually grow a little bit around the eggs, kind of cupping them into place. It kind of looks like a, a honeycomb uh, when the eggs end up falling off. Um, so this was something that was really exciting for me. And then that's kind of where everything that could happen and could go wrong actually did go wrong. So um, it was a real exciting time. And then it was a real not exciting time. Um, most of those eggs started falling off after the first 10 days. Um, he just started dropping them. A couple of them did develop into juvenile sea dragons, um, but they were only 21 days uh, instead of the 45 days. So they were kind of half developed. Um, and so that was just kind of, it was just all, it was just days and days of just it going worse and worse for me. Um, so if you go to the next slide, you guys can actually see the young that did develop. Um, there were six of them. Uh, you can see just the beginnings of what a sea dragon was. So the animals still existed. They still successfully bred. We still had that event happen. So I have to look at it that way. Um, so none of the young survived. Uh, obviously, these were these were the oldest ones at 21 days, so just completely underdeveloped. Um, the picture on the right is not from us. Uh, a couple of sea dragons have had young in the past year, I want to say, at other aquariums. Um, and that picture is from New England Aquarium, who had juvenile sea dragons probably five months ago at this point. Um, so that's what they should look like when they're born, um, just to kind of show you the difference and how quickly they would develop in those past few weeks. Um, so not only did none of the young survive, the male actually got an infection on his tail and then he died. So it was literally like the worst thing that could have happened. Uh, it just, it went completely south, but you just, you, you pick yourself up from that and know that it happened. You're doing something right. They were able to breed and then you just keep working on it. Um, we've had a few egg transfers since then, but nothing has been successful yet. Um, so it's still something that we're kind of working toward, but that was also something, like I said, highlight of my career happened during this exhibit. So it's something that I'm really proud of. Uh, so, once this exhibit closes, where is everyone going? Usually when an exhibit closes, we will send the animals to other aquariums, other zoos, we'll keep some of them. In this case, uh, every animal in that exhibit is staying except for one. So we have some ribbon eels in the exhibit that we just don't have a home for. Um, they need a very specific display. They need to be by themselves. We just don't have a good exhibit for them. So those will be the only animals that are actually leaving. So we will be shipping them to another aquarium uh, in April, but everything else in that exhibit is staying. Most of the exhibits are saltwater animals. So those animals will be going to our wild reef area. Um, so the corals, the fish, you'll see them all throughout the wild reef. I don't think we're going to put up specific signs that say it, but like the mantis shrimp will end up down there. Um, the fish that we've been able to breed will end up in that schooling exhibit on the left. The corals will go to uh, a lot of different coral exhibits downstairs. So that's where most of the animals are going to be heading. Uh, next slide. Where are the jellies going? Um, so jellies have very unique displays. Um, they can't be mixed in with fish. It just, it doesn't really work. Um, and there's not really a lot of jelly displays in the building right now. There's plans to have them in the future. Um, so we will be keeping the jellies that we have, but we will be putting them in our jelly room, which is what this picture shows. Um, our jelly room is currently under construction right now. Um, so it looks a little messy, but this is where the animals will be going. Um, so during the time of underwater beauties being shut down and the building of the new construction, uh, there will not be a lot. Of, there will be jellies on display, but not a lot. But the cool thing about this jelly room remodel is if you see near those gray doors, there's a large chrysal in front of it. We are going to be doing behind the scenes tours of our jelly room and that is actually going to become a touch tank so you can go on this behind the scenes tour and you can touch a moon jelly during the tour and see all of the jellies collections that we have so they'll be off display but there'll still be opportunities for people to see them uh next 
Okay, so animals move out. We have that space. We're not building another exhibit in there. This is the last one. So what's moving into the space? Um, I couldn't find the rendering of what the plan was for this beautiful animal health water quality pathology sweet area that's going in there um, but that is what's moving in so we have uh, water quality testing on site we have vets who are on staff um, which is great uh, there are a lot of places that have vets that rotate through different zoos and aquariums we have an entire staff of veterinarians and water quality techs so they will be moving from their space into our space it's like that first piece in a puzzle where you remove one and then everything just kind of starts shuffling around the building. Um, so animal health will be moving in. And animal health, like I said, is really great resource for us to have. They can help us with any sort of issues like a seahorse who's super buoyant. Um, you can see on that x-ray just the amount of space that's in its chest cavity. That's all air that's not supposed to be there. So they are there. They can help us address issues like this that day um, when something comes up, which is great. And animal health is also available for the aquarist when you accidentally get a porcupine quail in your finger or you get a splinter in your finger that's so deep that you need somebody else to help you dig it out with a pair of forceps. Um, but they do draw the line at when an Aquarius breaks their finger on a valve. They just kind of stop there. They're like, we can help you with, you know, quills and splinters, but broken bones that you actually have to go to a regular doctor for that. So they kind of draw the line there. Um, but also those are injuries that all happened to my hands during the run of this exhibit, which just shows you how, like, I'm either really bad with my hands or we just it's a really bad job to have for hand injuries. Um, so I just thought that was kind of a fun progression of all my injuries that I've had during this exhibit. My first broken bone, by the way, in case anybody cares, the very first time I broke my a bone was in this exhibit. So um, <laughs> next slide. So the special exhibits team, if we don't have a special exhibits to take care of, what are we going to be doing when this exhibit shuts down? And I'd mentioned the larval fish team before. Um, larval fish is a new concept that's just been in our building for a few years. It's been a concept through the aquarium, but nothing as formal as what it's been in the past couple of years. So the larval fish team is concentrating on raising certain animals that are in very high demand for other aquariums. Um, and the idea is shed can concentrate on a couple of species and another aquarium can concentrate on another couple of species. And we are able to raise those animals in an aquarium setting and then send them to other aquariums. It keeps us from taking animals away from the wild and kind of helps us support that idea of sustainability with raising your own animals in-house, but also providing them for other aquariums so that they're also not taking animals out of the wild. And if we concentrate on just a few species and somebody else does theirs, you're not you're not so scatterbrained trying to like do everything yourself. You're just concentrating on the few things that you can do and you can control. So we have these tubs on the right hand side picture. They're called molar tubs. And um, this is just what a lot of people are raising their larval fish in. It's a blacked out tub, um, high concentration of food, very low flow, um, just because all those animal animals are really delicate. So that's kind of what part of what we're gonna be concentrating on doing is raising up fish. Uh, next slide. In order to raise all of those fish, we have to have food for them. Um, so another big part of what we're going to be doing is continuing our live foods program. Um, live foods starts with algae, which is that picture on the left-hand side. Um, it's really pretty to look at, if anything else. Um, but different algaes are different foods, different nutrition. So while they are different colors, they play a different role in the nutrition of everything that we raise. So we start with algae. And we have algae, which then allows us to grow plankton. Um, that picture is not the plankton at Shed. It is from a book that I bought my son um, that I'm really nerdy about. And he enjoys looking at the pictures of the plankton. But that kind of gives you an idea of what they look like. So you can see the algae on the left to grow the plankton on the right-hand side. And all of those plankton are then food for the animals to eat. So it's all steps of nutrition that we can do in order to raise fish. Um, next slide. This is kind of, it's a lot, but this is what our live food space currently looks like. 
Um, I'm sure we're going to be doing some tweaking and rearranging as things go on. Um, but this kind of gives you an idea of like just the vast amount of space that we use to raise food, to then raise fish, to then be able to have them displayed. Um, and sometimes this job is, a, you know, past a 7 to 3.30 job. It's a weekend job. It's a holiday job. Um, we're always there working, even when things come in, when you're about to go out to dinner with your friend and you have to stand there in your nice clothes and take care of plankton, but we will do it because that's just, that's what we do. Um, so that's kind of what the special exhibits team will be doing once we shut down. Uh, next slide. Uh, actually, oh. that is um, okay. the cue for the Q&A. So if you have questions for Erica, please put them in the Q&A section. We already had a couple come through. Um, so Erica, we're going to start with Karen's question. She asked pretty early on, where do we get our corals? Okay, so there are a few different places that we can get corals from. Um, there are a lot of vendors that we work with that will go out and collect corals from the wild for us. Um, they have certain permits that allow them to take certain animals, a certain amount of animals. Um, and we work with people that are trying to do it as sustainably as possible. So we kind of vet our vendors as to where we get them from. But some of those vendors are also culturing corals in their facilities. So we can take corals from them that they have been growing for a few years where they are. Um, and then every now and then we will also get donations from people's home aquariums that have had corals get to be so large that they don't have anything to do with them. So we get donations that way too. Um, so that's mostly where we get all of our corals from. Excellent. Um, we have a question wondering about sea dragons. Um, how do we distinguish a male from a female since the um, male does carry the fertilized eggs? Um, so sea dragons are a little harder than seahorses. Seahorses are really easy. Um, the males have a pouch, the females do not. Sea dragons is a little bit more, um, the males don't have a pouch, so their body tends to be a little bit more tube-like. Um, the females tend to be a lot taller um, and kind of pinched in at the bottom. So it's it's kind of hard to, to think about it, but when you see them next to each other, you can kind of sort of see it. But the biggest thing with at least the sea dragons that we have, the male's tail has a very big color contrast. So it'll be like a super bright yellow spot next to a super dark blue spot. And I think that's an advertisement for, you know, put your eggs here kind of thing. So it just kind of like shows the tail where the eggs would be. Um, that's just with ours is something that I've noticed. I'm not sure if that applies to everybody, but it's mostly the tube body versus the really tall body of the females. Sure. Um, Elizabeth would like to know if we have any deep water jellyfish. Um, deep water jellyfish? No. Um, we do have jellies that can go into deep water, um, but most of those deep water ones are going to be really unique and um, just need a really specific exhibit that would be really cold or have a lot of pressure, um, and we just don't have the exhibits to be able to put those in there. So no, we don't, um, but I know other aquariums that do have it, like I think Monterey and Steinhardt have a couple of deep water jellies, but we do not. Um. Russell would like to know, are there any, and a couple of people are asking this, are there any longer term plans um, for special exhibits to come back? If that's going to be a thing again, or if we're changing things, oh. what is special exhibits going to look like in eight years? Uh, so as far as I know, there's no plan to have a special exhibit space in the future. So special exhibits the way we exist now, um, I, we won't be a special exhibit team because there will be no rotating exhibit. That may change. Um, they, that may be an idea that gets thrown in later on. But as far as I know, there's no plan for that. So we will actually be becoming the sustainability team. So everybody will still be around, um, but we'll just be culturing fish, uh, live foods, and just kind of concentrating on doing that as our job instead of working on a rotating exhibit. Sure. Uh, Ethan has a question about sharks. How okay. do we, we talked a lot about moving animals from exhibit to exhibit. Um, how do we do that with the sharks? Do they ever move exhibits? How, or how do we get them from behind the scenes to front of scenes? Um, so it really depends on 
the size of the animal and um, how old they are. So sharks are they start off life in an egg case. So we can move those egg cases, just pick them up out of the water and move them somewhere else because they're, it's all sealed in there. Um, juveniles are a lot smaller. Um, again, you could just pick them up and move them. Um, it's like a human going underwater for a little while. Like you hold your breath and you go underwater and then you come back out again. It's kind of like that just in reverse because we're taking them out of the water. When a shark gets larger, that's when it tends to be a little bit more logistics involved. Um, we have stretchers um, that we can move the animals. And if you've ever seen um, moving the belugas or moving whales or moving, you know, anything large, it's, we have a stretcher that we're able to move the sharks back and forth between exhibits. Um, when it becomes an issue of the animal is too large and we transport them offsite, that's a, that's a whole other thing. But again, it's moving the animal in a stretcher from exhibit they're in to a truck or a transport exhibit um, to then be moved to somewhere else. So that's kind of how we do that. It's a very simplified way of how we <laughs> it's do very, that. <laughs> it's a very simple way of a very complicated thing that happens. Yes. Um, Tara would like to know, does freshwater coral exist? Um, no. So corals only exist in salt water. Um, freshwater does have invertebrates that grow in it. Um, it will have like anemones and things kind of like corals, um, but corals only exist in salt water. And it's not just warm salt water. There are deep water corals that live in cooler water too. So it is salt water, but a variety of temperature ranges that a coral can live in. Um, and then the final question for you, um, as we think about changing spaces and our centennial commitment at SHED, um, how does having the labs in the special exhibit space and kind of in that more centralized location um, help you as you care for animals here at SHED? Um, so having, it's mostly an upgrade of a larger amount of space. So there's only a certain capacity that we have right now in our animal health suite. Like we do have a surgery suite for minor procedures. We have an exam room. Um, but with them moving into our space, it's also them having more space to be able to see more animals at a time. So as things come up, we have the space to do that instead of waiting a few hours for an animal procedure, we can do several of them. Um, it also is going to be in a location where I believe the public can see them too. So kind of get a glimpse into what animal health is doing, what water quality is doing, what our microbiology lab is doing. So just kind of, it just makes it a little bit more accessible to everybody, but also gives them space to be able to provide more services for us as well. Excellent. Well, uh, Erica, thank you so much for sharing all of this amazing information. Your passion for the animals at Shed is really shining through and we really like the little window into some of our operations. Oh, thanks. Well, you're welcome. <laughs> All right. I'm actually going to pass it now uh, to Becca from our membership team. Hello, Becca. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Becca Boyer, and I'm the manager of membership and individual giving here at SHED. And I just want to take a moment to also give a huge thank you one more time to Erica Moss for sharing such incredible insights, enabling us to take a look behind the scenes of underwater beauty. Of course, thank you all so much for joining us this morning. Um, I hope you all had coffee and really enjoying everything. You, our members, ensure our beautiful ecosystems across the aquarium remain healthy and thriving. As we learn together about these amazing aquatic creatures, we are better able to care for animals all over the world. And of course, your continued curiosity is critical to our work and our mission. As we look to our 100th anniversary in 2030, Shed Aquarium is thrilled to be embarking on a transformational centennial commitment. Our centennial commitment will take eight years to complete and calls for a $500 million investment for infinite impact. This is initiative is such an exciting surge forward as it leverages nearly a century of success to accelerate our work for people, for community, and for aquatic life. This vision will include deep community investments and partnerships, a modernized aquarium experience, 
accelerated aquatic research and science, and so, so much more. And we are looking forward to sharing with, more with you in the months ahead. As we begin this transformational commitment, we hope you continue to join us this spring to connect even deeper and leverage your impact as a member. In appreciation of your partnership, members always enjoy an exclusive animal spotlight every Sunday morning at 9.30 a.m. during Member Oceanarium Sunday. So you can go tomorrow or please join us on February 5th for an extra special iteration of Member Oceanarium Sunday, where members will enjoy coffee, juice, and snacks, and the chance to explore underwater beauty and this will be the perfect time to revisit the gorgeous exhibition illuminated by the great insights you heard today. To attend on February 5th, simply book your free member ticket online for Sunday, February 5th to secure your spot. Be on the lookout for our next Shred Talk coming in March and member Jazzin in June. In the meantime, do not hesitate to contact the Shed team if you need any help or have any questions at all. Thank you all so much again for attending and have a wonderful day. Thank you everyone so much. Have a wonderful rest of your Saturday and we look forward to seeing you here at Shed Aquarium very soon. Thank you so much.